please, and turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter number 22. Revelation, chapter number 22, and I respect for God's word after you've found that. Please stand with me as we read our text. Revelation, chapter 22, beginning in verse number 13. Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter into through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away of the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Even so, come Lord Jesus, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Our Father, as we turn our attention to your word this morning, we are very mindful, Father, of our total dependence upon you. And Father, we ask you now that you would give us wisdom as we attempt to discern your truth this morning. Give us understanding. And Father, may your Holy Spirit teach us your truth today. Father, if there be one here today that does not know you as Lord, we pray, Father, that today would be the day of salvation. Father, as we talk about God's final invitation, Father, we ask that your Spirit would move in our hearts today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may thank you. You may be seated. Well, it was a warm Sunday morning in June, May of June of 1992, when I entered the pulpit for the very first time in Emmanuel Baptist Church a long time ago, not really knowing what the Lord had planned for me. I came with an intense desire to preach the Word of God seriously yet preach it joyfully. And although throughout the years my desire and intensity for that truth has, has grown, and as well as my understanding of the scripture has grown, there's one thing that I have always believed. There's one great foundational principle that I have always believed. I believed it then, and I believe it just as surely now. That when I held a Bible in my hand, I held in my hand the living word of the living God. I have always believed that. But I don't need to tell you that this is the word of the living God. You know that it is the word of God. There is no other explanation. It is so apparently divine. My task is to tell you what the Bible means by what it says. And before I can do that, I have to have the Bible. And before I can say this is the Word of God, and you can see that it is the Word of God, it has to be the Word of God. What you hold, you need to understand this morning, that what you hold in your lap, in your English translation, I can tell you, is an accurate translation of the, uh, in English, of original manuscripts that were written by the authors of the Bible. You have an accurate <coughs> translation 
in the English language of documents, of autographs that originated thousands of years ago. That is one of the great things that you learn when you go to seminary. Because if folks, listen, if you had any wavering in your confidence about the integrity of the translation of the Bible that you hold in your hang lap, it will suck the conviction right out of your heart. Because if the Bible can be shown to be inaccurate, then you have no assurance of anything. So the basic question that should come on the mind and heart of any student of the Scripture as they approach studying the Bible is, is it accurate? Is it accurate? Now, I will confess to you that I am not limited to the English language. I went to college and I minored in Greek because I wanted to know what the Bible said in its original language. And I can tell you that I started out believing the Bible was the Word of God, and I left college believing even more that the Bible was the Word of God. And then I went to seminary, and I piled on more original language, and more and more original language, because I wanted to have the knowledge that what I held in my hand was actually the Word of God. And I can tell you, with, with strong conviction, that I believe it today just as strongly as I ever have before. Now you hold the Bible in your hand and you probably don't even think about the fact that there's a long history behind the careful preservation of the original text. Whereas thousands and thousands of years ago, documents were written, autographs were written, that give us the word of God. Now understand this, that all translations of the Bible are based on original sources. And these original sources have been compared by the most fastidious, dutiful, and thoughtful, careful scholars throughout the centuries. So that I can say to you folks unequivocally, the Bible you hold in your hand, if it is a formal equivalent translation, I can assure you that you have an accurate translation. But just so that I'm complete, you say, well, Pastor, you just mentioned a word formal equivalent. What does that mean? Well, there's two types of translations. There's a formal equivalent and there's a dynamic equivalent. Dynamic equivalent translation is a word for thought. The Bible, the translators of the Bible took the actual Greek word and they translated into what they think the original author meant. That's where you get your NIV your New Living Translations. Those translations are, are dynamic equivalent translations, and I don't have a whole lot for them to do. Then you have your formal equivalent translations. Formal equivalent translations is when the translators took the actual Greek word and they gave it a direct translation into the language what the Greek word meant. Formal equivalent translations would be your King James Version, your English Standard Versions, your New King James Versions, your New American Standard Bibles would be, would be called formal equivalent translations. The printing press didn't show up until around 1500. And so everything up to that time was hand copied by scribes. And they took seriously what they were doing. In fact, there are some amazing stories if you read, if you ever do some textual criticism studies, there's some miraculous stories about these scribes that would come to the translation of the original text. They would come, they would write a word, especially when they came and they would write the word Jehovah or the, some other Elohim or some other name of God. They would come and they would write the word. They would go and they would take a bath and then they would come back and write and then go and take a bath in this long process because that's how serious they were about what they were trying to do. We have, let me just kind of give you just a little comparison here. We have in the New Testament somewhere around 25,000 manuscripts of ancient manuscripts that are extant or that now exist. 25,000. Now, folks, listen, that abundance of manuscripts by which we compare them all helps us understand what the original authors meant in Scripture. Nothing in ancient literature, 
Nothing in ancient literature even comes close to the mass of documentation that we have for the New Testament. Now, I told you that there are over 20, we have over 25,000 ancient manuscripts of the New Testament. Over 5,700 of those are in Greek, and they go way back. They go way back. We have, I have manuscripts of the original language in my personal library that go back to the second century. We have found manuscripts that go back to the first century. There's one manuscript called P52, and they were numbered by, the, by, the, by how, when, and where they were found. Uh, and this, date, this is the Gospel of John, and it dates back to around 100 to 150. And John lived in the 90s. And so it is very probable that P52 was a copy of an original. They were, there were other papyruses, and they, we call it papyruses because they were written on papyri, which is animal, dried animal skin. We have a papyri called the Botmer papyri, in which we have the Gospel of John and Luke, and it dates from 175 to 225. And then there's another famous papyrus called the Chester Beatty papyrus, and it has all four Gospels and the Book of Acts, and it dates around the area of 200 A.D., and they go way, way back. And here's the amazing part. The amazing part is, is that there probably shouldn't be a lot of manuscripts during that time, should it? Why? Because the second century into the third century was a time of enormous persecution on the church in an effort to completely stamp out Christianity and the Christian scriptures. But the Lord and His sovereign providence preserved these texts for us very close to the original so that we would have what the Word of God said for us. Now understand this, and I'll be completely transparent with you folks, we do not have the original autographs. They do not exist. They do not exist. But God has preserved for us copies of those things. They go way, way back. And let me let, me let you in on this too. The doctrine of preservation, when we talk about God preserving His Word, has nothing to do with translations. It has to do with original autographs. God has, pre has preserved His autographs in the original language so that we can compare these and know exactly what God says. Now, once you get to the 4th century, around 325 or so, when uh, Constantine was making Christianity legal, the persecution ended, and now Greek manuscripts proliferated. They go everywhere. And so by the time you pass 325, the Council of Nicaea, we begin to see Greek manuscripts in abundance. The two most important ones, one is called, it's a codex, and codex means it was a, it was a uh, bound volume instead of a scroll type of deal, so they called it a codex. One was called the Codex Sinaiticus, and it was around 350 A.D., and it's a whole New Testament. And the other one is called Codex Vaticanus, which is around 325, and it's the whole Bible. We have 8,000 ancient manuscripts of the New Testament in Latin called the Vulgate. They're on the Vulgate. The Vulgate dates from 382 to 405. We also have 350 plus copies of the Bible in Syriac that go back to the 200s. Now here's the interesting part. He said there's a lot of interesting parts about this passage. Yeah, there is. I hope you're finding it to be so. We have all of these ancient manuscripts, and when you compare them, they all say the same thing. They all say the same thing. Now, if you take out the quotes from the early church fathers, before 325, what you had with the church fathers, you had the post-Nicene and the pre-Nicene church fathers. If you take the quotes from the church fathers before 325, we have 32,000 quotes from the church fathers, and you can reconstruct the New Testament just from the quotes of the early fathers. Now, let me give you something to compare that to. The second most common Ancient, doc, ancient document in the world is a manuscript called Homer's Iliad. You guys ever remember reading that boring thing? Yep. Next to Homer's, next to the New Testament, 
There are more copies of Homer's Iliad than any other piece of literature. And oh, by the way, there are 643 of those. 643. Small potatoes compared to 25,000. And oh, by the way, the oldest one of them is the 13th century A.D. Homer wrote in the 8th century B.C. We don't have any idea whether Homer has said any of that or not. Because we don't have a good witness. Another familiar piece of ancient history would be the, the Gallic Wars. You ever heard Caesar, Caesar fought his Gallic Wars. Uh, he wrote that in the 1st century B.C. There are 10 existing manuscripts. And the oldest one is dated a thousand years after Caesar wrote those things. Now some of you have probably heard of Herodotus. Herodotus was a Greek historian. Uh, in fact, Herodotus could be called the father of, of the historians. He was, he was the son of the first historian. He wrote in the 5th century before Christ. We have eight manuscripts of Herodotus' history, and the earliest is 1,300 years after he wrote it. One of the scholars that I had studied over the years, he's actually Brother Blue from Virginia. He's from Danville. Actually from Chatham, of all places. But one of the scholars that I have studied over the years is a man by the name of A.T. Robertson. He lived a long time ago. And uh, you'll see, if you ever do any study of the manuscripts or original language, you see his name pop up all over the place. A.T. Robertson said this, that to get this, folks, that the vast array of manuscripts has enabled textual scholars to accurately reconstruct the original text, listen to this, within more than 99.9% .9 accuracy. That's pretty good, isn't it? More than 99.9% .9 accuracy. Now, you may say, well, Pastor, and all those things, that they didn't make any er errors? Well, I didn't say that either. I didn't say they didn't make errors. They made errors. They put in the wrong word. They, they misspelled. They left something out. And occasionally, you'll find in these manuscripts where they added something to, to try to clarify something or make it, make it a little bit clearer. But the fact is, we have so many manuscripts that can compare those manuscripts that when, that does, when they've done that, we know that they've done it. There's no question. I mean, this isn't brain surgery. We know when they've done it. And so, Pastor, why in the world are you telling us all this? Well, because in verse 14 of Revelation 22, somehow that comes into question. The accuracy of the transmission of the scriptures come into question. And I want to explain that to you this morning. And as we approach the last few verses of the book of Revelation, God makes his final invitation to the world and how we should respond to it. Now understand what you have to hold in your lap today is the inspired word of God preserved for you through the centuries. My job this morning is to make it clear for you, okay? My job is not to defend God's Word. We don't have, folks, listen, we don't have to defend God's Word, do we? God's Word is like a lion. You just let it out of the cage. It'll take care of itself. We don't have to be on some mad pursuit to try to find the truth. We have the truth. We have all the truth. Our problem is, is we don't study to know the truth. But as we approach these last few verses of Revelation, these are absolutely phenomenal verses that I want you folks to understand tonight. As God gives the final invitation to the world. First thing I want you to see this morning is the invitation. And I want you to keep in mind the introductory remarks because we're going to come back to that, okay? I want you to notice with me the invitation. Look at verse number 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life 
freely. Now, folks, listen. There are two distinct persons that are addressing or that are, are speaking in this verse. The first address is a prayer for Christ to come. The second address is to the sinner. In the, in the verse, the Spirit, in this verse, the Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, responds to the immediate return of Christ by saying what? Come. The Spirit and the bride. Who's, who's the bride? The church. The Spirit and the bride, the church, the third member of the Trinity, and the church will in one voice cry out for the coming, the soon return of Jesus Christ. Now, the text does not specifically tell us, folks, why the Spirit desires the return of Christ. But I believe, as I, as I study the Scriptures, that there is both a positive and a negative reason why the Spirit desires Christ to come. Negatively, I believe that it's throughout the history of humanity, men and women have constantly denied and rejected Christ and the work of Christ and the power of Christ. They have assaulted the Holy Spirit. As we have seen in the discourse in Matthew chapter 12, that they take the work of God, they take the work of the Spirit, and they attribute it to the devil. The Bible says, therefore, us in John chapter 15 and verse 26, And when the Helper comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness without me, about me. Now, speaking about the wicked world prior to the flood, God says this in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3. Then the Lord said, My Spirit shall not abide in man forever. For he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. This stiff-necked, rebellious Israel constantly provoked the Spirit during their 40 years wandering in the wilderness. In fact, the writer of Hebrews goes on to say, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion on the days of the testing in the wilderness. Of course, that was something that they would continue to do throughout history. And so throughout history, men and women have constantly rejected the Spirit, denied His power, and attributed His works to the devil. In Nehemiah chapter 9, in verse 30, Many years you bore with them and warned them by your Spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the land. The sinful world's rebellion or blasphemous, if you will, rejection of Jesus Christ will reach its apex during the time of the tribulation. That seven year period of time will see Satan promoted to power and the two most vile and evil blasphemers who ever lived, the beast, which is the Antichrist and the false prophet, will come to power, and these two wretched, demon-possessed sinners will go on their dubious horrors of being the first people to finally be cast into hell. But they will first do a very good job of blaspheming the name of God and all three members of the Trinity. And throughout the long, dark history, folks, of the rebellion of mankind, the Spirit has constantly, constantly worked to bring about conviction and repentance. And so, as the Spirit brings about that conviction of rep to repentance, what is that conviction normally met with? Rebellion. A stiff-necked attitude. Blasphemy. And so, when Jesus says He is coming, the long-suffering, grieved Spirit echoes what? Come. Come. He pleads for Christ to come. He pleads for Christ to return, to subdue his enemies, to judge sinners, and to end the Spirit's long battle to produce conviction in stubborn, hard-hearted sinners. Now that's the negative side. 
But on the positive side, the Spirit and the church want Christ to come because it, it is the desire of the Spirit and it should be the desire of the church to see Jesus Christ glorified, right? So the negative side is the Spirit of the church want Christ to come because Christ has been maligned throughout all these centuries and by coming, He will subdue His enemies. But not only negatively, positively they want Him to come because coming, He will be glorified. In John chapter 16 and verse 14, He will glorify me for He will take what is mine and declare it to you. You know, the last view that the church, that the world had of Jesus was on the cross between two criminals. Rejected, despised, and mocked. And the Spirit longs to see His fellow member of the Trinity exalted in beauty, splendor, power, and majesty. And that will happen, folks, when Jesus Christ returns for His church and then returns with His church. All the people that have maligned Him, all the people that have rejected Him will finally be subdued when the King of Glory steps out on the precipice of heaven and comes back and first calls His church to Him and then comes back with His church. What a time that will be. He will glorify me for He will take, talking about the Spirit, for He will take what is mine, talking about the church, and will declare it to you. Now the use of the word come in this verse kind of changes perspectives a little bit. It is an invitation, not, only for Christ, not just for Christ to come, but for the sinner to come. Right? Look down at your Bibles at that phrase. Let the one who hears say what? Not only does the Spirit and the bride say come, but who else says come? Let the one who hears say come. That's the sinner that has, that has heard the gospel. You that are hearing, receive what you were hearing, and then you will with glad heart say to the Lord Jesus, come, come. Now, obviously, they will not do that until they come to faith in Christ. Only a child of God would truly love the coming of Christ. I will say that only a holy child of God would love the coming of Christ because there are probably some children of God out there who don't want Christ to come back because they're so unholy. Those who hear and obey the gospel will join with the Spirit and the church in calling for the return of Christ because they desire His glory and they too want to be delivered from sin's presence and go into the realm of sinful, of sinless perfection. Now the one who hears is further defined as the one who is thirsty. Folks, listen, let me tell you something. A sinner will only be thirsty if he realizes he's parched. And he'll only realize he's parched unless the Holy Spirit enables him to see that he's parched. Right? You can't minister medicine to a man who's already dead. You can't go up to a man that's laying in the hospital bed and say, well, you know, here's the gospel. I'm going to lay it right to the corner of his mouth and all he has to do is open his mouth and take it. Listen, church, he can't take it because he's already dead. A dead man can't open his mouth and take medicine. And a dead man can never thirst because a dead man will never know he's thirsty. He needs to be revived and made alive by the Spirit of Almighty God. And so then he or she can see that he's thirsty. A man can't reach, I've heard this analogy, a man can't reach for a life vest who's drowning in the ocean if he's already at the bottom of the ocean dead. He has to be brought up from the bottom. The rigor mortis has to be removed, right, Blue? And the moss has to be taken off. And so then he knows he has a need, and then he can reach to the one who is the need meter. Absolutely. 
I know that's bad grammar. Give me a break. We got it. And then as he brings him to life, he realizes he's thirsty. And the spirit and the bride says to the one who hears, and therefore as a result of the hearing, there is a divine order here, folks. They will never realize they're thirsty if they don't first what? Hear. Hear. Listen, you can believe in the absolute sovereignty of God and salvation and still be evangelistic if you really understand the fact that God uses means to bring about his will. And the way he brings about people realizing they're thirsty is by people hearing the gospel. The one who hears, then is the one who realizes he's thirsty. And the spirit of the bride say to those, those people that hear, and then those people who hear, now not everybody who hears will realize they're thirsty, will they? In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 7 that most people that hear will not realize they're thirsty. But they have to hear first. They have to hear first. And then the ones that hear, they realize they're thirsty. Because that is a prerequisite for salvation, isn't it? In Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 1, Isaiah says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Well, you say, well, Pastor, how in the world am I going to buy if I don't have any money? Isn't that ridiculous? I mean, Isaiah just said, if you have no money, come and buy. Well, what does that do? The Holy Spirit gives you what you need. The Holy Spirit gives you what you need. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. In Matthew Chapter 5 and verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. John 7, 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and what? Drink. I like what Jesus says. If what? Anyone. If anyone. Let me tell you this. Anybody. Anybody. Can y'all hear me in the back? Or do I need to speak a little louder? Anyone who comes to Jesus will find Jesus to be a perfect Savior. Anyone. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. John chapter 4 and verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will... <laughs> never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John chapter 6 and verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not be hungry. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 6, and he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Listen, salvation, the invitation is come, it is free. You come with no costs. No costs. And I'll even say this. Some of you all call me a blasphemer, but let me explain myself. Not only do you come with no costs, but you come with no obligations. <gasps> Pastor, you're preaching easy, easy believism. Just say a prayer, right? No, y'all know me better than that. Let me tell you something. The only person who feels obligated is a person that doesn't really want to do it. I serve Christ, not out of obligation, but out of love. I come, for I came in October 1985 with no cost and no obligation because the Spirit of God changed me and I serve Him not because I feel obligated to, but because I'm constrained to do it because of my great love for Him. That's it. That's no obligation for me to serve God. I love Him, therefore I want to. Yeah, I was, in fact, I will say if someone feels obligated to serve God, it's because they're not Christian. If you've never been born again, if you feel obligated to serve God, it's not an obligation. It's a privilege that the Holy Spirit of God plants in your heart at the moment of salvation and causes you to want to serve Him. It's without cost. Durine in the Greek, it literally means it's a gift. It's a gift. It's without payment. It's a gift. 
The imitation of the Spirit and the church is for the Lord Jesus Christ to come. Because we are tired. Remember what the saints under the altar said to Jesus in, in Revelation 5? How long are you going to wait to judge those that have killed us? What was Jesus' response? Get off my back. No, what was Jesus' response? Very gently. Rest. Rest. I'll take care of it. What does Jesus say to us this morning? Rest. I'll take care of it. Just rest in me. I know what I'm doing. You may not understand it, and I would dare say to you that if you can understand God, Carolyn, right? If we can understand God, He would be much of a God, would He? If our finite minds could understand Him. Carolyn asked me some very good questions this morning. But if we could understand God, He wouldn't be much of a God. But what does God say? He says, rest. And so the Spirit says, come. The church says, come. Because we are tired. Are you tired today? I wasn't tired until the sermon started. Now I'm real tired. <laughs> I, we are tired. You feel, better, you feel beat down this morning? You got some problems going on in your house? You got some problems going on in your family? You got some problems going on in your spirit? We are so tired. We are tired of seeing the Holy Spirit of God, Jesus Christ, malign. We're tired. The people of the church say, I am tired. Boy, I'm so beat up. Have you ever found yourself in your prayer closet and you're on your knees or you're sitting in your chair? And maybe you're in your car driving down the road. And this happened to me. You're driving down the road and you say, Jesus, just come back. Just come. There's absolutely nothing that ties me to this world. Nothing. Jesus, just come. I've done everything I wanted to do in life. God allowed me to do everything I wanted to do in life. I, I said as a teenager growing up, Lord, would you let me get married before you come back first? Would you let me get married? No, you let me do that. I said, Lord, would you let me pastor a church? We're going to let me do that. Lord, would you let me uh, have some children? So he gave me five goats. So um, <laughs> we, we did that. So my bucket list is gone. I am tired. Jesus, would you come back? And relieve me of this. I am tired. And then the invitation goes to the Son. He who hears and recognizes his thirst will say, Come. But not only is there the invitation, but there's also the incentive. There's the incentive. And I'm going to rush through this quickly because I don't have a whole lot of time. Would you bear with me? Y'all right? want me to continue? Well, I was going to do that, but thank you for your approval. That joke's getting kind of old, too, I know. Surrounding the invitation that the Spirit gives to the sinner, there are four, and this is really the heart of the passage, I think. There are four incentives for the sinner to come. The first incentive is because of Christ's person. Because of Christ's person. Look at verse 13. Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Now look at verse 16. I am, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root, get this, I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. The first reason that the text gives us why the sinner should receive Christ's invitation is because of who he is. He, he Because of who he is. He is, this invitation, folks, of to come to Christ is personally from the exalted, majestic, Glorious Jesus Christ, Lord of glory. He calls himself the Alpha and the Omega. That is the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. He is not only the Alpha and the Omega, he is the first and the last. 
He is the beginning. In other words, He is the source. And He is the end. He is the goal of all things. This same God is the person that invites the sinner to come. To hear. To recognize your thirst. And to come to faith in Christ. In the Bible, when Jesus Christ says of Himself that He is Alpha and Omega, He is the first and the last, it expresses Christ's infinity. It expresses His eternality. His boundlessness. The fact that He transcends all things. There's, there's no limitations to Jesus. And that same sovereign, limitless God calls a sinner. Even the sinner who is religious and thinks he is saved to come. But it also carries with that not only the greatness of who he is, but it carries with it the greatness of his authority. He says, I, the sovereign Lord of glory, tell you to come. Because the word come there is in the imperative. It's not a question. It's not a request. Salvation, repentance is a command. And he commands it one more time. And he also identifies himself here as the root or the, the root and the offspring of David. You know, only God, only the God man could be both the root and and the offspring of David. The root meaning that he existed before David. The offspring meaning he existed after David. Only the God man can do that. Of course, Jesus Christ in his deity existed pre-David as the root of David. And then Jesus Christ in his humanity existed in the flesh as the offspring of David post-David. Again, giving a tribute to his kenosis, his emptying of himself at Bethlehem. And then finally, Jesus Christ describes himself as the bright and morning star. To call someone the bright and morning star in ancient days, folks, was to exalt that person, to elevate that person. And the bright and morning star became known in Jewish history as a title given to the Messiah. Jesus says, I am the Messiah. In Numbers chapter 24, <clears throat> I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star <clears throat> shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down the sons of Sheth. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawn, until the day dawns, and the what? Morning star rises in your hearts. And so the incentive of the sinner to come, the invitation by the church and by Jesus, is to come. Not only for the coming of Christ, but also for the sinner to come. And the incentive for the sinner to come is because of the person of Christ. You the sinner has been required, has been commanded by the sovereign Lord of the universe to come. But not only because of the personal Christ, but because of the exclusivity of heaven. Folks, listen to me very clearly. And I know that for many of us, this is this is review. And I and I and I pray and trust that you're finding a blessing in the words of the words of Christ today. And I know this is basic. But I say this with a with a, with a, with, with deep-seated emotion. Not everybody goes to heaven. Not everybody goes to heaven. Look at verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city, for without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Now, verse 14 is one of the reasons, or the reason that I went over all the things that I did during my introduction. 
because there's what we would call in, in Greek grammar or textual criticism is what we would call a, a significant textual variant that appears in verse 14. Now I want to approach this carefully, but I want to approach this truthfully. There are several Greek manuscripts. Remember I talked to you about all those Greek manuscripts that we have. The Greek manuscripts are co collected into different families of text. He's oh boy, here we go. Now hang with me. This is exciting stuff. Yeah, maybe for geeks, but okay, well, whatever. But this is exciting stuff. These group, the Greek manuscripts are collected in different families of text. I'm not gonna go, they're basically four families of text. I'm not gonna go over those with you. It doesn't really mean anything to you, but just take my word for it. There are four families of text, four areas. They, they're actually grouped together by four areas of the world where they were collected. <laughs> One of the families of text was called the Textus Receptus, or the TR for short. That would be the Greek manuscript that underlies the King James Version, the New King, King James Version spe specifically. Another group of manuscripts would be called the Critical Text. Those originated from the other three corners of the globe, or, but more of them originated down in Alexandria and Egypt. Now, I want to show you something on the screen here, and I'm not trying to baffle your mind here, but I just want to show you something on the screen. Everybody see that? That is the first part of verse 14 in the critical text, in the text that were found in Alexandria, Egypt. This is from a 2nd century Greek manuscript. I want, to, I want to flash up another phrase for you, another Greek phrase, and that's this. That is from the Textus Receptus. Do you see a difference? Still the same first part of verse 14. Same stuff. Do you see a difference in the spelling? Not big, is it? Not a big difference. I mean, you've got plunotes versus poiunotes. So it's not, a, it's not a big difference. But you need to understand that there is a that the differences in the spelling result in a difference in the translation. Why? Because they're two different words. And it's likely that the second phrase, the one that's in white, which is from a 12th century Greek manuscript, it is likely that a scribe who was handwriting, because again, the printing press wasn't invented until the 1500s, it is likely that a scribe handwriting this from an old manuscript, from an old papyrus, because animal skins crack, you may, I mean, and they're, and they're writing by candlelight, they didn't have 300 watt fluorescent lighting back in those days. They didn't have computers to, to double check. I mean, I have a computer that tells me when I spell, spell things wrong, and I still, still spell them wrong. I mean, they put that little pesky little red squiggly line under it, and I still get it wrong. I still come to the pulpit and so say, where did they get that spelling? So they didn't have any of that. And so it was very likely that when this scribe in the 12th century came to copy this manuscript that was probably not from the 2nd century either, that through the old, through the age of the papyri and through the uh, poor lighting, he very well could have thought that it said poiunetes instead of plunontes. But what's the difference? One says, one says, what? Blessed are those that do his commandments. That would be the one in white. That would be the 12th century manuscript. The one in red says, blessed are those who had their robes washed. <coughs> now there's not, again, that's why I went over all that stuff at the beginning. Not a great difference in spelling, but a massive difference in translation. What does that mean? Well, if you take the oldest, which we usually, old, we, there, are, there are several factors. But if you talk to any textual critic, one of the factors that they take into consideration is, in fact, the age of the, the age of the manuscript. That's always a factor you have to take into consideration. If you have a 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century manuscript that reads one way and a 12th, 13th, and 14th century manuscript that reads three different ways, which will probably take the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century manuscript to read all the same way. Because that's probably more original, more likely original. So what that means is this. The verse 14 Instead of reading, blessed is the one that does his commandments according to the original manuscripts far back, should actually be translated, 
He who has had their robes washed. He who has had their robes washed. Why? Because there is an ex. As you as you read that in the Greek language, there is an exclusivity of heaven. You don't get to heaven by doing the commandments of God. You get to heaven, folks, by having your robes washed. It reminds me of Joshua, the high priest, standing before the Lord. And the, and the Bible says that Joshua, who was standing before the Lord, had his robe spotted, stained by the flesh. And what did God say to him? God said, take away his robe that's spotted by the flesh and give him a robe pure and clean. Because it's not about our efforts. It's not about who we are. It's about having our robes washed. Rome says it's about keeping the sacraments. Rome says it's by indulgences. Rome says it's by transubstantiation. Rome says it's by confession. Rome says, yeah, it's by faith in Jesus plus your works. The Bible says, no, it's by having your robes washed. And the only way that your robe is washed is by the blood of the Lamb, not by your efforts. The Mormon church says it's by your efforts. The Jehovah Witnesses say it's by your efforts. The United Methodists say it's by your efforts. The liberal Southern Baptists say it's by your efforts. The Episcopal say it's by your efforts. The Bible says it's by having your robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. There is an exclusivity of heaven. But we not only get that, folks, and another reason why we take that reading from the second century is it's not only that we have that reading, but we also have a cross-reference. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. What, folks? They have washed their robes and made them white because of their efforts. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Listen, church, this is basic for all of us, but listen very clearly. It is very vital that you and I understand that salvation in Christ is not by our efforts. Salvation in Christ is not by religion. It's not by a church, but it's by having our robe washed in the blood of the Lamb. God's final invitation before the canon of Scripture closed is to remind people that salvation is by having their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb, not by human effort, not by your works, not by your goodness, not by even your fastidious devotion to an empty religion, but by having your robe washed in the blood of the Lamb. And by our having our robes washed in the blood of the Lamb, that it has it has freed us from sin. Well, I like this. It has freed us from sin, hasn't it? It has freed us from the penalty of sin. When I've had my robe washed by the blood of the Lamb, I have been freed from the penalty of sin. I will no longer be held accountable for my sins. I have been freed from the penalty of sins. God has given me the righteousness of Christ. If you remember our Sunday night studies on this, God has given us the righteousness of Christ. And he looks at me and he says, Michael Huffman, you are a dirty, wretched sinner, but you are righteous. Your robe has been washed in the blood of the Lamb, and so therefore I give you the righteousness of Christ. I don't see your filth. I don't see your sin. I don't see your grime. I see Jesus, and I call you righteous. I don't understand that grace, church. But he says, I give you my the righteousness of Christ, and I call you righteous. And then the day will come when he will take away the alien righteousness of Christ and he will give me a righteousness that's completely my own in glorification. Amen. And then he says, For without are dogs and sorcerers, verse 15, and whoremongers and murderers and adulterers, and whoever, whosoever maketh and loveth a lie. Those things that are without the city, 
The Bible says, first off, they are dogs. Now, I want you to understand, you love dogs, don't you? Well, understand in the first century, dogs were not domesticated animals like they are today. Dogs were seen as scavengers. They weren't household pets. They were seen as city dumps. And so they are, so when someone in the Bible, when you're called a dog, it's not a pleasant thing to be called. And God says, without, without the city of Jerusalem, those people that have not had their robes washed, there are dogs and there are sorcerers, hormones, all kinds of people that hate the truth. And those people that hate the truth aren't included in heaven. There is an exclusivity of heaven. And the only people that get to heaven are those people that have had their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. But not only because of the person of Christ, the incentive of the invitation of the person of Christ, the exclusivity of heaven, and because of the truthfulness of Scripture. Look at verse 18. G John, uh, Jesus says in verse 18, For I testify unto you that every man that heareth the words of this prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto the things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the city and from the things that are written therein. Let me tell you something, folks. You better be careful when you tamper with God's word, right? right. We have an invitation, and the incentive of that invitation is based on the truthfulness of Scripture. The truthfulness of Scripture. I think it's very, very fitting to end the canon by warning people by adding to it or taking away from it. Don't tamper with God's word. Folks, listen. As pastor, my job is not to tell you. <coughs> my job is to tell you what, the, what I believe the Bible means by what it says. My job is not to give you my interpretation. My job is not to take you and sit you around a little table and say, well, let's go over this verse. What does this verse mean to you? I've said this many times to you folks, and I'll say it again. I don't care. I don't care. I don't mean this hard-heartedly. I don't care what the verse means to you. Quite frankly, I don't care what the verse means to you. And you shouldn't care what the verse means to me. I care about what the verse means. What it means. Don't tamper with God's word. Don't, don't give any credence to the apocryphal works. Don't give any credence to the Gnostic Gospels. You know, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. This would include Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon. This would include Charles Taze Russell. Uh, and the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses. This would include Barry, uh, Mary Baker, Eddie Fry, she had a lot of husbands, from Christian Science. Because those people are people that tamper with the Word of God. Don't tamper with God's Word. The psalmist exclaimed in Psalm 119, verse 97, he said this, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. In 119, verse 113, I hate vain thoughts, but thy law I love. I hate vain thoughts, but thy law I love. I hate and abhor lying, in verse 163, but thy law do I love. In verse 167, my soul keeps your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. Listen, the child of God loves God's word to such a degree that we wouldn't dare tamper with it. Adding to it, Taking away from it. Don't tamper with God's word. So the incentive is because of the person of Christ. The sovereign Lord of glory gives you a command to repent and believe. Not put your faith in a religion, but to repent. Because of the exclusivity of heaven, repent by having your robes washed by the blood and the blood of the Lamb. And because of the truthfulness of Scripture. But here's another incentive. One more and we're out of here. One more I'm going to do this quick. Because of the certainty of Christ's return. He which testified these things, verse 20, saith, Surely I come quickly. Even so come, Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Folks, listen to me, church. Jesus is coming. Yes. Jesus' return is imminent, meaning that there's nothing that has to happen for Christ to return. He is coming. He is coming. Are you ready? Have your robes been washed in the blood of the Lamb?
Are you ready? Let's pray. Our Father, we're mindful today, Lord God, that your grace and grace alone has saved us all. And that you have given us eternal life. We thank you and we praise you, Father God, for this time that we've had in your word. And Father God, I pray that your word would ring true and steadfast in the hearts. And I pray, Father God, that if there be one here today that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that they would be saved today. We praise you and we thank you for all that you've done. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'll be dismissed. Thank you.